Um, so, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Amulia Bundada, and on behalf of everyone at Kai Park, a uh, warm welcome today uh, Tech Talk. Um, it's a very exciting area of data science. We'll be discussing uh, transforming industrial processes uh, with synthetic data. And hi to all our members who have joined. And for those who are not members yet, I'll give a quick intro about Kai Park. So, well, Kai Park is a, an NGO and it's a um, cooperation platform for growing application of uh, AI in Germany and Europe. It's a uh, ecosystem of German and European industry, research, AI startups, and public and private uh, partnership associations. Um, we are, a he we are headquartered in Berlin, but we operate with members across uh, Germany and Europe. We started uh, at the end of 2021 with 12 founding members, such as uh, Volkswagen, Scheffler, Deloitte, Fadi, Salones, um, Friedrich uh, Alexander University, uh, Humboldt Innovation, and several others. Our newer strategic partners include um, the German Swedish Chamber of Commerce, and we are them, the Swedish companies. Um, we have around uh, 60 European startups as members, mostly German. And yeah, uh, that's as you can see, we are just growing uh, pretty fast uh, with lots of members and more to come. Um, so at Kai Park, we um, support our members in various ways. Uh, it could be uh, we are onboarding workshops with the corporates to co-define uh, projects for use cases. Uh, we then also do matchmaking with uh, between corporates and startups. So to have a project team, that's a combination of both. We have expert exchanges on the uh, latest tech and uh, regulations as well. Um, and I'm just thinking of uh, some of my research uh, recent uh, topics that we uh, are working on and just to give some examples like uh, NLP, um, deep reinforcement learning, um, the impact of the EUA Act in the companies, um, as well as infrastructure related topics. So it's it's a wide range of topics. Um, so if you would like to know more, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And uh, now it's uh, actually about our tech talk. Um, so to kick off our tech talk um, today, uh, we will discuss uh, an important and practical topic regarding the application of uh, synthetic uh, data uh, and how uh, we can use them in different use cases as well as industries. Um, synthetic data is uh, especially useful in building uh, robust models uh, and for uh, accurate predictions as well, especially where the real data isn't uh, available or is difficult to obtain. And so, for example, in the healthcare industry, where patients' data uh, can be shared easily, um, but also in training models and simulations in uh, financial sector as well. So using synthetic data could even reduce the reliance uh, on costly and um, time-consuming data collection as well. So today uh, we will discuss about uh, synthetic data for uh, in terms of images as well as text, um, and we share some key learnings uh, from our experts on using synthetic data for robotics, uh, digital twin, uh, agent-based reinforcement learning, and we'll also discuss um, different use cases in different industries like oil and gas, um, financial services, healthcare, or even in outer space like Mars. So um, a quick shout out to all our viewers. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question at any point to our experts, uh, please feel free to uh, type it in the chat and we will answer at the end of the tech talk. And yeah, so now uh, a quick introduction, I guess, of uh, everybody here. Um, um, <laughs> the first one is my picture. So, uh, well, I'm Amulia, and at Kai Park, I take care of uh, programs and large projects with corporates and connecting them with startups. Um, before this, I was uh, working with uh, at one of our founding members, which is Volkswagen, who is responsible for leading data strategy for financial services as well as um, M&A related topics. 
and I began my studies and uh, career in AI research focusing on visual motor robotics. So very interested in what uh, one of our speakers is going to talk about. But yeah, right now in strategy and innovation in corporate. So that's why Kaipa. So I'm really happy that today we have experts from both industry as well as the research side to share their insights and key learnings on synthetic data. Um, we have uh, Marcus Muller. Uh, he's from DLR or the uh, German Aerospace Center, and he's the team lead for the exploration team at the Institute of Robotics and Mechatronics. Um, and then there's uh, Mikola Maximenko from uh, SoftServe, which provides solutions for big data analytics and ML. Uh, as well as other solutions. Uh, he's the Associate VP of Technology, so it also includes global R&D for AI. And last but not the least is uh, Christian Beinman. Uh, he's the head of um, Helmholtz Information and Data Academy. Um, so he does a partner for this tech talk. So please welcome Christian to give a quick intro on HEDA. So hello also from my side. It's, it's a real pleasure and honor for, of us um, from the Helmholtz Information Data Science Academy to be co-host here of this um, tech talk. Um, and therefore I want shortly to introduce the um, Academy of the um, Data Science of the Helmholtz Association. Um, before I do, I do one word about the Helmholtz Association. We are Germany's largest research organization and 18 national research centers are organized in there and they are active in technical and natural sciences. So um, in the in the application fields of energy, of earth and environment, health, information, matter, and then aeronautics, space and transport, um, where the German Aerospace Center DLR is our center in this field. Um, in, um, we want to um, present you that the Helmholtz Association is, is a really attractive environment for excellent scientists and talents as we are running a lot of large um, research infrastructures and, and very comprehensive and holistic research programs um, tackling grand challenges um, of, of science and economy and, and um, your society. We as a HEDA, the Helmholtz Information Data Science Academy, um, we have the aim to to um, implement knowledge of data science and information science into all um, of the Helmholtz centers. And therefore, um, we have organized six research schools, six major research schools um, that are deviated all of our centers. And, um, and with these six research schools, um, together with 17 top tier universities, um, we are the Germany's um, largest postgraduate um, training program. Here you see all the schools that are deviated all over Germany. Um, and you see there that the DLR, the German Aerospace Center, is um, a partner in three of these research schools. And they are addressing um, several topics in information and data science. Um, the, the, the academy itself is a network over the schools and overarching and making um, supplementary offers. And so we're, um, we're running a lot of training and exchange programs so um, we can exchange um, researchers um, between the centers and from outside and also connecting with projects um, in our international partners. We're doing a lot of networking events and, and data science events also like hackathons and so on. And we are um, active in scouting for the best talents to get in our centers. Um, for example, our job offers that we promote there and, and a lot of events and um, we hope um, to can present you how great science could be done in our association by the talk of our researcher Markus Müller and um, that will follow up now. So therefore I will hand over um, to Amulia. Um, here you see um, our, our um, yeah, um, our, our connections in the social media and then at either you can gain experience and um, build our your networks and make great data science. So thank you and I'm very um, interested in the talk now to Amulia. Thanks for sharing about Hida, Christian. Um, yeah, since uh, I think I already gave an introduction on, on what you're discussing about synthetic data, uh, so keeping an eye on the time, I hand over to Marcus to start his uh, uh, start sharing his experiences, basically. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for having me. Let me share my screen. All right, just a very quick confirmation. You should see the, the presentation in full mode now. Is that correct? Yep. Perfect. All right, then let's get started. 
All right. Well, if you go skiing in the mountains or you cycle with your bike somewhere in the Netherlands or you have a fancy car and you take it out for a ride, they all have something in common. They are lots of fun. But they also have something else in common. If you do not know your environment and you do not know your road ahead, they can also go terribly wrong. The same thing what applies to humans also actually applies to mobile robots. They also have to know where they are going and the same what applies here on Earth also, of course, applies to any other planet which is out there, also to Mars, sadly. And one very sad example is actually the Mars mission Spirit, where the Spirit rover got stuck in a sand paddle. Um, so I think we can all agree that some sort of semantic understanding of your environment, what you see around you, is very crucial. It's not just crucial for traversability reasons for mobile robots on Earth and space, but also if you want to do any kind of other scientific work. So, for instance, if you're looking for a particular rock, some kind of terrain, or you're not even entirely sure what you're looking for, you need some kind of semantic understanding of your environment. Well, it does not really come to a surprise for all of you, I guess, that also for this one, we're investigating the use of machine learning. And if you use any kind of machine learning, what you know very soon is you need data. And with deep learning, you usually need a lot of data. And you also need some kind of intelligent network architecture. Both of these things are actually quite difficult and challenging when it comes to the planetary exploration task. First of all, with data, we just have been to so many places out there and collected the data. And the network architecture is difficult because computational power, what we have of these rovers, we just want to discover the unknown. So we and do not always know exactly what we're looking for. And the entire world, what we're looking at is very unstructured. In this presentation, I'll focus more on the first part of the data and give you a little bit of a glimpse how we try to tackle this problem. To give you more of an impression what kind of data I'm talking about, I brought you here some samples from Morocco, which my colleagues um, actually uh, gathered. And this kind of like uh, environment is actually a, a Mars environment, an analog environment. And if you look at this image, you might have some idea how you would label this one. Like in the foreground, you see some sand, you see some rocks, and also in the distance, some sky. So that's kind of easy. But if you give you this image here, it's getting already much more difficult. In the foreground, again, you see sand, but then you see all of these different rocks and you're not entirely sure, do I have to label all of them? You see the background and you're not entirely clear anymore, like what kind of terrain are we looking at? And then I give you an image like that and tell you, well, we have to actually label all of these individual rocks because you might want to have it like for a rock sample uh, instant segmentation network. And you can see that it's first of all very tedious and also very difficult because you cannot even really see where the, the rocks starting and where they're ending. So we were thinking, okay, this is actually a big problem. We cannot always go out to all of these different planets, all of these different locations on Earth, collecting data, and then go home and see if somebody can label them for us. Um, it's tedious, and the other thing is it's always limited. So we are thinking, is it not possible that we can synthesize, simulate all of these different worlds, what we can actually imagine? That's the reason why we created Oasis. Oasis is a blender-based simulator which lets you auto-generate all different kinds of terrains. Due to its material-based semantic techniques, you do not just get object IDs, but actual the material semantic information. And you can label the same data set with different levels of semantics. So different people from different communities can work together on the same data set, but labeling it differently. You get different mod modalities like instance label, depths, and all that kind of stuff, what's interesting for you. Um, although it was intended for the planetary use case, you can also use it for any other unstructured outdoor environment. For instance, here, a forest environment, um, a water environment, or anything else which might be even Earth-like. I mean, after all, Earth is also another planet. Everything can be configured via a config file, and the German Aerospace Center actually publicly released even the code for this one. So if it's not enough for you, um, you can try it out, and you can also extend it um, always for your particular use case. To understand a little bit how OASIS does what it does, let's break it a little bit uh, into the pieces. So in the beginning, we loading in some kind of mesh, which we call the global terrain. So it's global terrain information, and it's actually called the stage. 
This is by default some kind of this landscape what you see here in the image, but it can also be some kind of dunes or anything of landscape you can actually imagine. We're taking this one and then we randomly deform this global terrain information. Once we have done that, we can take care of the more local terrain information, particular materials and objects. And this is now very interesting what happens here, because what we can do is we can use pure textures, for instance, here, this mud texture on the left side and gravel texture, and we know their perfect semantic labeling. Now we're using some kind of like noise texture, we're merging that together, and what we obtaining in the end is a mixture of terrains. And since we know the perfect label of these different initial textures, we also can retain the information about what kind of uh, texture and where the different terrain is actually laying. Since the uh, noise is basically just a, a random distribution, we can sample from this distribution. And with that one, we get different uh, mixtures of terrains. Once we have done that, we have applied these materials to the stage, we can now also place different objects. Usually what you see in a lot of simulators out there, particularly in the inter use case, they use some kind of physically based placing of objects. And that makes a lot of sense, particularly if you have just a few objects. However, if we're talking about the outer use case, we're talking usually about thousands or hundreds of thousands of objects. In this case, these methods usually do not scale so much anymore. That's the reason why we use particle-based systems and also in the newer versions of Blender geometry-based methods. You cannot just only place objects like rocks, but also trees or even buildings or whatever you can imagine. Once you have built up the entire scene, you can set up the lights, set up the different sensors you would like to simulate, and then you're rendering everything out. In this process, you repeat as, ma as often um, as many samples you need from the particular uh, environment. Once you're done with this world, you just destroy it, you create a new world, and you're sampling again. You're continuing doing this one until you have your entire data set, which you can then use for training. To give you a little bit of a glimpse of these um, outputs, what we're getting um, from examples, I brought you some example images. So here, for instance, we have different gravel textures, sand textures, and rocks, and different light conditions all combined together. Also a sample here from uh, a snow environment with some rocks in the distance and gravel. And on the right side, you see the uh, corresponding semantic uh, labeling. Another image from this distribution. And now, once we were able to do this one, we were thinking, OK, for us, it actually looks already quite realistic. However, just because it looks realistic for the human doesn't mean that it's actually realistic for the machine. So we had to really test if we can train now on synthetic data and then actually use it for the real thing. That's what we did initially. So we used the standard segmentation network, which was pre-trained already, and then we fine-tuned it on our simulated data. And then we applied it to the Morocco data set, what I showed you before, what you can see here on the right side. And just from this qualitative results, you can already see that from the prediction, it's actually mapping quite well already with the ground truth from a human annotator. So it's actually already quite promising. Now that we were able to see that like this thing works already like with some of the data sets, we wanted to see can we actually apply it for the actual task what we have um, with the, the different robots. And for this one, I would briefly like to introduce you one uh, very important mission what we had last year actually, which is called Arches, where we went for one month on the Mount Etna, Volcano Etna in Sicily and tested our heterogeneous robotic team with many other robots as well, rovers uh, were involved, different kinds of rovers, also flying systems, and tested everything in this environment, which is very moon-like, as you can, um, I think, clearly see actually in on these images here. And one important thing what we always have to do when we're talking about like this mobile exploration in the planetary case, what the scientists want, they want to collect any kind of samples. So there can be soil, there can be rocks or anything else. Now, if you want to collect rocks, usually what your robot will see is something like this here in the image. And before you actually can grasp any of these rocks, you have to identify each individual rock. Once you have done that, you can show that to the scientist. The scientist says, this is the rock I want. And then the robot can autonomously grasp one of these rocks. But you have to identify them first. 
And for this one, we actually, uh, my colleagues developed the so-called Insta network, which is purely trained on synthetic data, which a simulator called Plenderbrock in the indoor use case. So it basically just has seen any kind of household objects. And with this one, it is able to identify unknown instances in the image. And we were thinking, is it possible with this thing, which is already trained on synthetic data, if we can make it even better when we now use data from Oasis, which is much more targeted for the particular use case. So these are like some images which we created with Oasis. You see on top the RGB image and uh, on the button, all of the instance uh, labels, which are corresponding to it. A little bit more impressions here. And you actually can see it helps a lot. So um, on the left side, you see how Insta would have performed without any fine tuning. And on the right side, you see how it then actually performs with the fine tuning. And in general, we can say that Insta, even by itself, it was purely trained on these synthetic data. It's actually working very, very good already out there in the wild. And so good that for the entire mission, we were always able to um, identify these different rocks, what the scientists actually want to crest, and then we're able to crest them with the robots. Not just on these analog environments, we're using um, synthetic data, but also for actual space missions. So for instance, we have the MMX mission, which will be launched next year, where different German, inst German aerospace institutes working together with Kness and JAXA to build a rover, what you can see here in the image, and send it to the Martian moon Phobos um, and perform different experiments there. And one of the experiments is an autonomous navigation experiment. So we autonomously drive around with this rover. And for that one, we had to test and still have to test how good actually our visual navigation is. And for that one, we use simulation as well. One particular case um, I would like to point out is for instance, and the problem we had in the beginning, that the assumption for all of these planetary robots is usually that the world around them is static. And that usually holds because nothing in front of them is moving, aliens have not been detected yet, so nothing is basically walking in front of the camera. However, when it comes to the MMX mission, we have to traverse very, very slow. The reason is if we would go too fast, we would actually have such a velocity that we would basically fly away from, from the moon itself. So we have to be very slow. And with that one also our frame rate is actually very low. And that means that nothing in front of us is directly moving as an object. However, the sun is actually changing. And when the sun is changing, also the shadows are changing. And we have actually like not a very static environment anymore. So also here we use um, simulators or in this case also aces again to simulate these different um, sun um, lightning conditions and see how much it's affecting actually our visual navigation not just in space we're using simulations but also here on earth for instance we have the ahead project where we're working together also here with different german aerospace centers uh, and the world food program to tackle the last mile problem just in a nutshell, last mile problem is basically something bad happens somewhere like an earthquake, for instance, and you have to bring goods, foods, medication to people in need. Now, usually it's very difficult to get there because of the infrastructure, which is destroyed. That's the reason why the World Food Program uses these sherps you see in the image. However, even with these all-terrain vehicles, it is usually very dangerous for the human to drive there. And that's the reason why we want to teleoperate them. And what we're doing now is we have actually a simulator called URSIM, which lets you simulate the entire software stack of this um, SHARP and also other robots, what we have in the Institute, all software in the loop basically, and we can test all of our methods. You can also use that to train then your different operators before they're actually operating the real SHARP in the environment. Now, we're using simulators for so many other more tasks here in RM and DLR as well, also more for industry, medical reasons, and all that kind of stuff. Um, too much to tackle just in one presentation. Um, but with that, I hope I was able to give you a little bit of a glimpse how we're using it and um, to also show that it's very important for us already. It opens a lot of different fields for us, a lot of different opportunities for testing and also development. Maybe I also got you interested to build up your own Wonder World with Oasis. Uh, try it out. Um, you can always reach out to me if you have any questions about also the projects, what we have and what we're doing. And yeah, with that, I thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks for sharing. Um, lots of interesting uh, topics covered, and uh, I'm sure uh, our viewers have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions, which I'll ask at the end. Uh, but for now, uh, it's uh, I hand over to Mikoa. Uh, welcome, and uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you, Amalia. So um, my name is Mikoa. I'm very glad to be talking in this environment. It's a very interesting topic, and because my team actually works in variety of different uh, interdisciplinary directions. So we work from life science to uh, machine perception to quantum computing, biosignal processing. So in all of these directions, we here and there actually uh, also uh, face the challenge that sometimes you don't have enough data, for example, to test your hypothesis or to train your models. And that's where we also came into uh, into the necessity of simulating data. We also have a very strong machine perception, uh, human computer interaction team, which also works with uh, the synthetic uh, environments like Unreal or Blender. And that's actually helped us to have in one team uh, different disciplines, which allow you from physics informed AI model construction to uh, to actually simulating some of these processes in uh, environments like Blender or uh, or Omniverse from NVIDIA. So I actually wanted to touch base on a few of these cases that we actually are um, uh, working on. So particularly, Marcus was telling uh, the story from the perspective of vision, that uh, for visual data, it's quite important that it's a lot of challenges of actually collecting this data, and this data uh, already from, from the standard perspective, like if you go to supermarket, you want to actually uh, have uh, have some system which probably recognize the, num uh, the products on the shelves. And even this like simple problem which we face every day in our lives is actually very challenging from the engineering perspective, because all these products, they have different shapes, they can be actually in different positions in the fridge, they could have different packaging. And uh, actually, visual environments like uh, 3D environments that are very good for simulating those. However, there are challenges, and I want actually to uh, also notice on some of those. Uh, and particularly, one one of the challenges that we face in our work is sometimes these 3D data generated uh, images are often too perfect or too ideal for training machine learning models. So they can train well, they actually showcase you very good performance. But in the end, you actually, uh, if you move these models to real life, you, you face the challenge that uh, in real life, you have a lot of unpredictable sometimes uh, errors and defects and imperfections, which actually need to be accounted. So that's where actually we combine some expertise in physics and, and optics to, if you're talking about image data, uh, that, uh, that helps us to simulate those imperfections. For example, if we have optical sensors, which kind of has some fish eye effect, so then we want to actually simulate that kind of fish eye effect already in the in the environment. So that's one, one example. However, I wanted to move that to something beyond vision. So uh, vision is out there and everyone actually understands it very well that we need a lot of this data and it's very hard to label all this data. However, in the in what we face in real life, actually industrial applications, it's also uh, some some processes which are, for example, uh, which could be, for example, in the production environment or a production line on on the factory, or it could be building a new manufacturing facility where you need to understand that uh, what could be. Uh, what what should be the architecture of the particular facility in terms of the uh, human performance and in terms of actually production line performance? So here here is where we actually combine uh, combine se several layers of uh, of different synthetic data simulations. So here, for example, the platforms like Omniverse uh, could allow you to to simulate uh, to simulate the full facility. In, in the visual environment in such a way that you can actually build optimization models on top of that and understand like what what happens if you move uh, if you move different parts of your production uh, here in, uh, in different parts of your environment and on top of that on top of that you can actually also uh, uh, 
build variety of computer vision models which can train directly in this environment. For example, uh, you can also think about or uh, simulate uh, human activity and digital synthetic digital humans which actually communicate and navigate in this environment. And from this perspective, you can also see a variety of edge cases scenario as which would could be important, for example, for various a lot of uh, like some dangerous activity that might happen in this environment. So I want actually to stress on a few cases. Actually, Amulia just mentioned that, for example, uh, in oil and gas, that's uh, that's something that, uh, that that's a vertical that where we actually actively work in. We had very interesting uh, interesting projects where we where we built a reinforcement learning model, which helped us to explore uh, different uh, possibilities, different states uh, of a space in which oil rig, for example, operates. In that case, in this particular space, if you build a new facility, we typically build a digital twin prior to building that facility to explore uh, to explore a variety of edge case scenarios and generally explore variety of safety scenarios. And here we actually use, on top of this uh, digital twin simulator, we use the reinforcement learning model, which actually allowed us to first explore the whole space of uh, space for, for this particular digital twin. And on the other hand, uh, we we discovered some of the policies, some of the uh, some of the actions of these agents, which actually allowed to uh, to increase the production of the oil uh, higher than if this facility was operated by the human agents. Um, another good example of kind of synthetic data is using the so-called agent-based modeling. So that's that's actually often not think uh, people don't think from this uh, about from the synthetic data point of view, but that's that's an old technique which is often used by physicists, for example, to model uh, various complex systems with, with emerging properties, as for example, uh, society or economic processes or a flock of birds. So typically these uh, these agents they have very simple rules how they interact with each other, but when they operate on the scale, you start seeing a lot of emerging uh, emerging phenomena, uh, which uh, in the end could actually govern the so-called software physics of the whole system. And in our case, we actually used this kind of approach uh, to simulate an economic system of commodity trading. Uh, such that uh, if you have different countries with different currencies and they need to trade it between, between each other, there are simple rules how these how these agents actually operate. And in our system, we actually studied like what happens uh, what happens if we actually have this system put on uh, on uh, blockchain technology and this enables actually scaling it up to an enormous uh, scale. And in that case, we could actually understand like what happens uh, if you put a particular a particular value for a commission of an operation, or if you put a particular amount as an internal currency for, for these operations between countries. And uh, we would we, we were able to actually see a variety of emerging phenomena which actually start to start to uh, to, to be visible in the simulation and could be tracked then by the machine learning model if you want to actually detect those anomalies in the real world. So that's another good example. And finally, I will probably mention uh, our very recent project where we also combine uh, synthetic data with physics and quant AI and, uh, and, uh, and actually various sensing data from real world. So this is a project that our team is uh, doing on simulating the methane emissions. And uh, the, the problem here is often that uh, you, currently in real world people operate in this, uh, in this, uh, with this system by analyzing the satellite data, some on-site camera data or on-site uh, physical sensor data. And often this data is not sufficient to fully make a prediction, to fully understand what is happening on site with particular emission. Uh, and our team actually here did a simulation based in Omniverse, 
uh, which allows us to, based on this partially available data from different sensors, to make a few simulations of gas propagation such that uh, such that we can see variety of uh, shade and peculiarities uh, for which we can actually hunt in uh, in our machine learning models, which actually analyze the physical real data from the satellite imagery, for example, and also predict methane emission of a particular factor, for example. So, uh, so wrapping up, I, I wanted to, uh, in connection to Marcus' talk, I wanted to say that. Uh, synthetic data is not only about vision, it's, uh, it's a broad field which connects uh, multidisciplinary components from uh, simulating vision, but also to simulate by the environment, the whole environment, or uh, build machine learning models on some of the digital twin kind of models, such that in the end we could build a variety of very complex, uh, complex architectures uh, for for actually very important uh, practical applications. Thank you. Thanks, Mikula, and thanks for sharing all the different industries and the e examples. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, and so overall, thank you, Marcus and Mikula, for the insightful uh, discussion on synthetic data. I'm opening the floor for questions from the audience, if anyone would like to ask a question. Um, um, please write it in the chat and I, I keep looking at it. Um, while you guys write your question, uh, I can already start because I have questions too. Um, so my uh, first question is for Marcus. Um, you mentioned that you use more than one uh, simulation. So is there any plan to have just one simulation in the future or uh, will you combine all the simulators? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So we actually uh, had the same questions uh, quite in the beginning when we also started to create and develop all of these simulators. Um, the answer is basically yes and no. Um, so we always try to combine some of the efforts what we're doing with the simulators. However, there are good reasons why we have these uh, multiple simulators. They're usually very much designed for a particular uh, use case. So for instance, um, exactly um, as was also pointed out, like um, the simulator I presented right now, for instance, they're very much on the image space. However, then we also have simulators which are more maybe on the control side where you can do then also more of the reinforcement learning. And all of the requirements of these simulators are quite different. So some of them want to have photorealistic data. Some of them want to have control rates of something like a kilohertz and higher. Some other ones uh, want to have the entire software in the loop. And it turned out for us actually that in the majority of cases, it makes more sense to have these multiple um, kinds of simulators um, instead of just having one which is ruling them all. However, we are usually exchanging a lot of the information and content and also like different kind of modules between these different simulators. So it's not entirely um, disjoint, um, but they have a good reason for these specific reasons why, why they are basically a bit more isolated. Thanks um, for explaining that. Um, and, and another question I had was, since you talked about Mars uh, and also um, uh, the other options that are there, um, what terrains were the most difficult uh, for you to simulate? Uh, so um, in general, I would say basically a lot of the terrains, I mean, also what CGI has problems to, to, uh, to simulate. So for instance, having very realistic, uh, water is usually very difficult. And another thing which um, um, is very difficult is actually snow. And snow is actually very interesting for us to simulate because we also can find it or ice basically on, on different planets. And the problem there, for instance, is that um, you actually have a lot of like subsurface scattering. So the light actually goes under the surface and then the, um, the texture looks very different. And to simulate this one to a very realistic state, um, is um, is quite challenging, I have to say. Interesting. I never thought of ice. <laughs> um, so my other question is for Mikola. Um, so you mentioned uh, the financial sector. Uh, would be interesting to hear uh, in terms of synthetic data. How your what was your experience uh, for like rare events? 
uh, so black swan events or uh, something like random like COVID? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's actually a particularly interesting point because uh, particular Asian-based modeling, this is a technique which allows you to discover those. So you would never, you would never actually otherwise learn uh, to extrapolate from from everyday data. You would never learn to actually, actually to extrapolate to any kind of black swan event. So this is actually uh, quite well known in economic physics, for example, that if you if you build a ecosystem if you build a model uh, which is built from this tiny tiny agents which actually operate between each other which can actually contact between each other so finally you will find various emerging properties and that's actually particularly what we did in our project for the customer we actually built a kind of econ physics model and we analyzed different uh, kind of phases of of this social social system so in one phase we see that that this that system actually operates properly. Transactions go uh, go from one agent to another, and uh, uh, and for example, this internal currency uh, within this ecosystem is not accumulated within one hand, and it's this kind of circulating. However, if we change the parameters, for example, we can increase the commission, or we could for each transaction, or we could change some dynamics in a particular transactions of this particular agents. You could see that the system kind of starts splitting into clusters and uh, kind of breaks down, such that it, and in the long term it will not be functioning. And in the long term, for example, investors who can invest in this technology to build such such ecosystem could actually lose money because that that will not work on the scale. So that allowed, for example, our customers to understand like what would be the right uh, right parameter regime uh, for for their system. To function well without actually breaking abruptly, and another case it was actually allowing to train machine learning models to learn uh, for for these anomalies, which kind of like predictors for for these events. Thanks for the explanation. Okay. Uh, we have a question from the uh, audience from Jens Hoger, who's asking. Um, Using agent-based models for data synthesis sounds to me like it's a good way to detect uh, specific behaviors that might also occur in the real world, such as uh, reactions um, to the market in the financial sector or ways a robot might learn to walk. The question to me, however, is how you would compare behaviors in a synthetic and a real environment. Um, is there a good way to do this objectively? I would say I would say that particular agent-based modeling is uh, it's very good at scale. It's probably if you if you go to, down to individual agents, they are overly simplistic quite often. So it's hard uh, hard to uh, it, it actually the difference is very very visible. However, if you go at scale, you start seeing those emerging performance. And to compare it with real-world data is actually a good question. So quite typically, you need to build to build in some kind of a more or less reinforcement learning loop. So you, you have actually your real, real world performance, real world scenarios, and you try to feed back into, into some type of parameters of your agent based model, that information from the real world such that it doesn't break, break down as well. So it's, it's quite important. So yeah, so that. That's more or less on, on this question, but uh, I will be actually discuss this further. Maybe I can uh, actually quickly comment as uh, well to this question. I had this very nice example of methane propagation. So, uh, particularly uh, in our case, uh, that was kind of a combined model. It's, it's semi, it's not really agent based modeling, but it's very, very similar in the spirit in some sense. So, we had a simulation. For methane propagation, for like gas propagation, but at the same time we had a lot of real-world data and sensor data, and uh, so so in in fact it allowed us also to kind of fine-tune fine-tune the model and also discover some uh, edge-case scenarios, like what would happen if suddenly the wind will blow in a different direction, or what would happen. If suddenly the temperature like of the environment will change abruptly. So this is this is typically very hard 
to observe in real life, even if you observe your system for like years of experience. So this is some kind of a black swan event that we can simulate uh, in, in your model and can see how this will manifest itself in the sensor data. Thanks for explaining that. Uh, again, um, uh, there is one more question from uh, me and Shen. Um, to Mikola again, um, thank you for your insights. As you mentioned, that real world is full of surprises and potentially uh, anon anon <laughs> anomaly. <laughs> um, I cannot agree with you more from my experience working uh, with big sensor time series data with real vehicles. I'm hence curious what kind of data quality and how much data uh, would be needed if one were to simulate uh, anomaly in big sensor data. I would say, uh, I would say so here, if you, if you know what kind of anomaly we want to achieve, so we can actually particularly simulate that anomaly or like uh, find the physical model for that anomaly. That's that's one thing. Another thing is that we can we can build some kind of a greedy model, which actually is uh, fine tuning our uh, simulation environment in the way that we actually discover more of those anomalies. It's kind of curiosity based training in this case. So because in, in fact, yeah, if we just run our system, it may be that anomaly is just like somewhere on the on our long tail of distribution that. Even in the simulation, you actually rarely, rarely uh, encounter this. So it's worse actually uh, having some objective function which actually particularly suited to generate those anomalies. Uh, yeah, speaking of data, a uh, quick question to uh, Marcus. Um, where did you get the uh, textures from that you're using in the simulator? Um, so the one thing what you can do, and that's actually what we do very often, you just get a lot of like databases out there on the web, and there's a lot of like actually free textures, PBR textures available, and entirely data sets from um, different industries as well. So the film industry has actually a lot of uh, samples which you can just download and then use. Um, in some cases, we are still going out into the field to also collect data ourselves. So for instance, on Aetna, and actually last week uh, we were in the USA at different national parks to also collect their terrain data. Um, it's always quite an effort actually to get this particular texture data um, if you want to have it in a high quality. Um, but yeah, but if you if you want to do anything with these kinds of death, uh, assets, it's incredible actually I have to say how much you get open source already already for a little bit of money um, on different web pages. And so it's actually um, a very good resources to start with. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, I guess as uh, since we are nearing the end of our tech talk, uh, uh, maybe one of the final questions. Um, uh, what would both of your, uh, Marcus and Nicola, your outlook be uh, in terms of the application of synthetic data? Uh, we see a lot happening now uh, in different industries, uh, even with the journey um, in advertising. Um, so how do you see uh, it change? Uh, or what, how do you see the outlook for from the research side uh, in terms of space even, um, but uh, also from here on Earth uh, in our different industries? Shall I start? <laughs> All right. So I guess I, I, I take a little, a little bit more from the exactly space and, and robotic side. Um, so I think we, we will see much, much more, of course, like the um, simulators which are out there. I mean, also the truth is like the base of it, right? Like the the engines which are developed there, Unreal Engine, Blender, or like if it goes more to the LR um, um, engines, um, it's incredible how much work is actually um, done there and uh, that we usually can open sourcely just uh, use this one. So I think we will see much, much more of this one. And we will also see more development of different algorithms for some kind of applications where we never had data before, what we can now at least try to tackle. And 
I think what you will also see much more is that you have um, much more of the system in the loop. So we can test already in advance a lot of the things before we actually deploying it on the system. And that's actually for robotics uh, a very, very good thing because um, Deploying something on the robot and then trying it out is also very dangerous. The robot can uh, destroy something or so the robot can actually harm uh, somebody. Um, so testing everything in the simulation and in this um, simulation in the loop, I think is a very great advantage. However, I think um, there are also, um, of course, some risk and also like a big question out there, particular for this image uh, space, maybe as well the question more. And the risk I see a little bit is, that um, we are now able to simulate a lot of things and um, the danger might be that um, we trust our simulations and also the engineers trust the simulation too much so we're testing much more things just in the simulation but do not test it in the actual real environment and i think there we all have to be quite careful i mean in the end the simulation helps us to develop new algorithms to test them as well however we also always have to go out in the real field to test it if it's actually working in the real thing and um, the question i think which is still out there and it's not entirely answered yet is how realistic do we have to be with all kind of simulations which are there um, and how much work does the method actually has to handle? It's a little bit of a chicken egg problem because what we are now able to do is we can generate our own data and we can now develop these different methods. And um, the question is, where do you put more focus on and how do you split basically your data attention? Do you try to just build more simulators so your method is actually working better? Um, because you have more data or do you say well the simulator should not be too good maybe or i cannot like build it even better but now the method should be actually uh, put more attention on this one and i think that's a very interesting question because otherwise you in you're basically introducing that's a hyper parameter in your entire learning process which is the simulator itself and um, the question is um, how all of this one can be put together that we have like this equal attention on there. And I think that's a very interesting uh, particular also research question uh, for the future. Okay, I, I will pro probably comment here that from our perspective, we see actually a lot of interest from the customers uh, that start to rise in. And I'm actually very happy about that because generally we, we start seeing that uh, just real world data is often not enough to build uh, production systems in various varieties of industries, even starting from basic retail applications, ending uh, ending to with something specific like semiconductors industry where this data is just not available, or healthcare industry where, for example, you need to to build some tiny ML applications, for example, for tracking varied variety of dangerous situations in the hospital, for example, and you just cannot use this data from the real world. You need to simulate this data somehow, and that's where actually synthetic data and like variety of tools like digital human from NVIDIA uh, can actually help uh, to simulate, like, for example, different polls or different like uh, situation or like crowd uh, dynamics uh, in indoor environments. So that's that's an already good sign. So I think uh, it becomes uh, quite a standard that if you build a variety of complex systems, we need first to build kind of a, a synthetic data or simulation kind of layer, which allows us to test a stress test variety of scenarios and also fine tune our machine learning models for a particular actually edge cases in a particular environment and. In financial industry, we know that these stress tests were there for, for like many years already, but now it's kind of starts to penetrate into different other industries. Thank you both. Um, so uh, thanks, Marcus and Mikola, for sharing your experiences uh, when applying synthetic data to the different uh, use cases. Um, and thanks, Christian, for joining us and sharing uh, how he does set up uh, in, in Germany as well as uh, abroad and uh, the kind of uh, opportunities that are available for everyone here in Germany. Um, and
Thank you to all our viewers uh, who have joined us today and for your questions. Um, yeah, this, uh, this video is recorded, uh, but please uh, feel free to share your LinkedIn profile if you would like to keep in touch and uh, follow us on LinkedIn as well. So um, yeah, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Very exciting uh, news coming up uh, I, I, from what you've shared so far. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to see how things will de uh, develop in the coming months, not I won't even say years, just months, even now, the speed at which things are going. So thank you and wishing everyone a nice day. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.